Welcome to White Hat Security's HackerCast. Uh, this is the this is the show where we talk about all things AppSec in the last week, kind of current events for application security. My name is Jeremiah Grossman. I am the founder and CEO of White Hat Security. And with me, we as always, we have Matt Johansson out there in uh, Houston, Texas, at where we have TRC <laughs> doing battle with Mario. <laughs> and we also have Robert R. Snake Hansen out in Austin. Yep. And uh, we're going to get to talk about all sorts of AppSec stuff. So let's uh, let's get this going. The, the one that hit all kinds of retweets to, today when I posted on Twitter was this .NET, Microsoft's .NET is going open source. What do you guys think about that? Oh, my God. Do you have any idea how many .NET sites are going to get hacked as a result of that in the near is term? That is that what you think is going to happen? They're like oh, the bad guys yeah. are going to dive in and start hacking stuff. Like so, so. What? Oh, I, I'm I'm going to. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of torn about it. I'm not as pessimistic as Robert. I'm kind of on on the camp of okay. Well, now the good guys have the code too. So let's see what we can find. It's a race to find whatever you can, right? And I, I the wake of that is only going to last. A short period of time, right? Kind of the arms race of fuzzing the code now that you have it, and then it's like, okay, we're back to this is the bar, right? Yeah, that's that's why I say it's a short term thing. In short term, it'll be terrible. I think if you're on .NET, you should probably be very worried at the moment. But long term, I think it'll be really good. I think it'll, you know, very similar to Apache. You know, they've gotten a lot of those bugs worked out over the years. So, so that's a good question. So let's say, so you you run a .NET environment. And the thing goes open source, and you know the bad guys are going to be looking. So, what are you what are you doing at this point? Like, what like what's the good defense? What's the prudent thing to do? Uh, <laughs> 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 it totally, oh, no. totally, yeah, it totally depends on the type of attack, right? If it's a protocol level thing, you're screwed because you're you're going to have even if you put like a proxy in line or front end it with like Akamai or DOS arrest or whatever, it doesn't matter because they're just probably going to pass the protocol, like if it's HTTP protocol stuff going on that causes a buffer overflow or whatever, you're done. There's no, there's no help there whatsoever. Uh, if it's a, if it's like a denial of service through like flooding or something, sure, you could probably front end it. Uh, if it's like malformed stuff where it might interpret it different than a proxy might, sure. It's actually a very similar thing happened with Slow Loris. I mean, Slow Loris was absolutely vulnerable. Uh, Apache was vulnerable to it, but proxies weren't. So front ending it with a proxy actually helped in that case. Uh, but, you know, it totally depends on the type of attack. Completely. Yeah, we don't know what we don't know, right? Like, who knows what kind of bugs people are going to, you know, start to weed out of this stuff now that they have access to the code. Right. I think it's kind of cool that people can start to run source code scanners against it now that it's open source. I think that another important thing to mention is that it's on GitHub. That's pretty huge for GitHub to have this relationship now, Microsoft.github.io. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty interesting for people who are on .NET. I, I, there's nothing really to do differently, I don't think. Right. It's just monitor, try to find your own bugs, try to find your implementation problems. And let's let's see what the community flushes out now that they have their hands on the code. So, yeah. so I think I, I think we'd all agree that there's going to be new vulnerability things that you got to patch. So you have to uh, work. You have to, I guess if you're running .NET, and you know this is coming, so you have to get your patch process up to speed so that when the patches do come out, you can get it down fast because it's going to be like you know the shell shock poodle thing all over again. Yeah, I don't think we can rely on a patch Tuesday anymore. This model. Um, because you know people are just gonna start disclosing it because they've got access to the code. They can just go fuzz it and find it. But uh, but I think it's good. I mean, long term. I mean, I'd like to see Microsoft doing this for all kinds of stuff, including all of their abandoned code. There's all kinds of things like XP that are just totally abandoned. So put them on GitHub. Have have some people like resurrect does, them. Instead. Does that mean IIS? You know, might be one that uh, they'll open source at some point. I don't, I don't have a list of what they did open source, but there is Microsoft.github.io, and it's not just .NET. There's a ton, yeah, yeah. There's a ton yeah. that they open sourced. So. So, so, okay, so we got the, the .NET, what may be going to get hacked, but then we have this next story that came up. The, uh, the you know, browser stack got hacked. And uh, for those that aren't familiar with browser stack, these are the guys that, you know, you build a website, you have to make a cross-browser, and you submit your site to browser stack, and they test it in umpteen different browsers to see if it's, it's, all, the, if it's all good. And uh, it's a good service. 
So they got hacked and, you know, somebody was posting as them. They got at least some customer information, but not a lot. But Browser Stack, to their credit, actually came out with a very detailed incident response thing. It's, you know, it's far more than we could talk about here, but it's definitely worth the read. So kudos to, kudos to those guys for letting everybody know, you know, what happened and how they reacted and so on and so forth. But here's the thing. I don't, there's probably other people that got hacked by Shellshock, but that's how the bad guys got in. They used the Shellshock exploit against a uh, an Amazon instance, one that was old and, and forgotten and unpatched, but as, as they admit, should have been. Um, so they, the bad guys, whoever they are, they hack this system and they get their Amazon, uh, their Amazon keys, you know, because they didn't change them. They had this old, outdated system. The bad guy stole the keys and then they hit the production systems and started pilfering data that way. So uh, and then it all kind of snowballed from there. So once again, you don't go after the primaries; you go after the secondaries. Yeah, yeah. I think browser stack this stack is a pretty interesting target, by the way. I mean, there's think about if they had really you know some time to sit on that vuln and like really like watch everything that's going across the wire can you imagine all the crazy like internal projects and things that aren't yet live that were visible to them if they had access to that stuff i mean that's a pretty devastating place to attack kind of a weird one but really very smart actually yeah i can't i mean it kind of reminds me there was the uh there was like a github competitor uh can't the name is escaping me at the moment, but same, very similar sounding story, similar company focus, and they got hacked and actually went out of business for it. Do you guys remember this a few weeks ago, a few months ago? Um, so I, I hope that their incident response is is uh, cleaner and it doesn't cost them a lot because, like you said, it's a really cool service. Yeah, it looks like for the browser side, guys got it under control. Again, they, they, they audited everything. They, they had all the backups in place. So they did a really good job. And uh, I think that was the key. This other, this other service, I, I, I'll put it in the recap when I think of it. But um, the, uh, they didn't have the, the, the hack. They hacked into their AWS account basically, and they didn't, they didn't have any offsite backups. They just had S3 backups. Oh, so, bummer. Yeah, they just got whacked and wiped off the planet pretty much. So. So let's also talk about this other one here. Um, you know, the Tor services decloaking had the FBI in. They took down a whole bunch of those hidden services. I think Robert, Robert, you were you were looking at that one, right? Yeah, there's actually several different things that are kind of interesting. First, um, they believe that uh, the the Ross Ulbricht of this other um, Silk Road, Silk Road Two, I forget his name now. Uh, he was actually using his personal email address to like register like domains and stuff that were related to the site. Uh, so that didn't require a whole lot of work to find the guy and uh, nail him. Not but good also, No, terrible upset. And it's a very similar story to Ross Ulbricht, um, uh, who was shipping himself like uh, passport uh, and the customs found those passports and found him and, and it was just it, all kinds of bad <laughs> but the other thing the other thing that was kind of interesting uh that matt matt found a link um about uh, various different types of decloaking uh that uh could have been used to find out where the right the real server was the real tor hidden service was so the theory goes that they were dosing a whole bunch of uh tor nodes and basically forcing traffic to go through um, nodes that belonged to, let's say, the FBI or whatever, Interpol or whatever it was. Um, the other thing that could have been happening is uh, they could have been monitoring the entire internet and watching for sites that were going down and figuring out, well, this site might be correlated and you do it enough times, you're like, okay, this one seems to always go down. When we attack this one, this other site on the internet and its ISP tends to lag or go down or whatever. And then you can figure out where the real target is. So, yeah, that was, so that was the interesting one. So obviously when a whole bunch of hidden services on Tor or any, any time the sanctity of Tor is called into question, obviously the Tor developers get uh, really concerned, but in this case they couldn't figure out how the FBI or how those services were decloaked. So they, their blog post is pretty exhaustive on all the ways that it could have happened. And you know, one of them was SQL injection. Yeah, I think the most interesting one, that's what I was just about to say, was as far as we're concerned, is SQL injection was on the official Tor blog post was listed as a pretty prime candidate of possibilities of how law enforcement found uh, found some of these hidden services. So I guess what would you do? You SQL inject in and then force the system to call back out over a non-Tor channel? Yeah, that's, that's what's confusing about that. Or, or, I mean, not really if you don't know what you're talking about, but if you've ever set up a Tor hidden service, uh, the, whole, the whole point is you make it so there's no way to route traffic out other than through Tor. 
So that really shouldn't have been possible. I mean, unless he like put my name as whatever in the source code or something. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if you're all of a sudden querying the database, you can get information about the actual database box, not the web server. Yeah, uh, but again, but again, it should have been, you know, my humble opinion, there should sure. have been possible way to pivot from that point back out to the internet. It should have gone back out through Tor or nowhere. Well, that, yeah, that's, the, that's the interesting thing. It's I, I guess setting up a Tor hidden service is not forgiving. You know, you, you have to know, you have to know OPSEC, you have to know how to set up a service, you have to know the pitfalls. Is there a checklist to go down to go, now I can't get found, and if you make one mistake, it's over. So it's just not, it just doesn't seem like a very forgiving environment. Now, one thing that happened with Docsbin, um, which is kind of interesting, somehow Docsbin, they, they had a copy of the secret key used for uh, the Tor Hidden Service. So they've been doing this sort of tug of war with the FBI where they'll take it back and theoretically the FBI can take it back from them again since they have the same certificate. Um, so that could have been one thing that the FBI could have done is uh, they could have gra grabbed that key if it happened to be on that server and um, in, a, in an accessible way through SQL injection um, and then use that to take over the entire .onion uh, URL, um, which is possible. I mean, that, that definitely could have happened. So, so maybe in the next couple of months, we'll probably figure out how they actually did it. Um, so we'll see. And uh, there's this last story I wanted to cover, something about Microsoft and S Channel, Matt. So what, what was going on here? Yeah, this one's pretty bad. Uh, it's been a it's been a fun year for TLS. Um, I'm trying to personally stop saying SSL. Uh, <laughs> from my vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> fight the good fight. <laughs> I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah, because now no one will have any idea what I'm talking about. Exactly. They never, um, do. They never do already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you know when that S pops up and the lock turns green? Yeah, that broke. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, Microsoft uh, S Channel, or we can call it Chanel. <laughs> we, need to, we need to name it something here. Uh, yeah, it was uh, this one was pretty nasty. Uh, there was a remote code execution vulnerability that dropped on uh, this S channel package. And what S channel is is a Microsoft implementation of turning on uh, TLS. Uh, I'm guessing through IIS servers uh, and the like. So yeah, I mean, this is kind of in the in the same vein of Heartbleed and things that we've been seeing over the past couple months of uh, if you're running S channel to implement your TLS, you probably have uh, a matter of a few more days before this is being widely exploited, uh, if that. Uh, so please go patch immediately. <laughs> so, the, so, so, so the patch is available? Yes. The patch and, uh, is available. So so I guess is this. Uh, I guess how many people does it affect? And uh, are we? I guess we have to get on. We're we're getting on top of this one to start checking for. It. Is there enough information to start checking for this one remotely? Yeah, Microsoft has a bulletin about it. MS fourteen zero sixty six remote code execution in S channel. Yeah, and we have the version numbers and the affected packages. Yeah, Windows Server uh, two thousand three and up, two thousand eight. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole laundry list of uh, I, I, I heard it was like a 16 or 18 year old bug or something like that. Yeah, Windows Server 2003, Windows Vista, Service Pack wow. 2. I mean, this is nuts. Yeah, it's been around for quite a while. I hate hearing about these kinds of things because it's like, okay, yeah, we just figured it out, but when someone somewhere must have been sitting on this, right? So yeah, I, I guess you know a lot of wide scale infrastructure bugs coming out this year. It's uh, you know they always every year that's always like the year of the hack. Um, you know, this uh, 2014, it looks like every bit every bit as bad as 2013. Um, lots more big bugs and things like that. But one thing that's interesting to me this year, it seems like people are uh, are getting really fast at patching. You have to. And uh, maybe it's the, maybe you should also call it the year of the uh, of the vulnerability logo. <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I think part of this uh, is coming down to this super homogenous uh, network that we've sort of built you know everything's on just a few web servers um so you have you have one of two options you can have a really um super super cut and cut and paste like over and over the same servers again and again and have it really quick to rapidly you know redeploy or rapidly patch or whatever or you can have sort of a hodgepodge of a lot of different things in which case you have to do that 
but you have to do that on every single one of your servers, depending on what vuln comes out. So you get hit by every vuln everywhere affects you because you have so many weird things in your network. So the trade off, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. this is like, hey, AWS, click this button and you stood up a Drupal instance. Done. <laughs> like, okay, cool. <laughs> well. Sounds like someone somewhere in the company is going to do that eventually, right? Like this is the problem that we're fighting. So it's all fun and AppSec. I guess that just means that uh, you know videos like this and just keeping up to speed on things is good. Uh, just staying out of the way. Uh, you know, a little bit of diligence keeps you out of trouble. Let's hope. <laughs> all right, thanks a lot, guys. This is uh, another episode of Hacker. What is this, Hacker Cast Nine? Number nine. All right, I'll see you guys for number ten. Thanks, guys. Take it easy.